Hello, welcome to this special edition of Talking Europe, where today we are tackling a splashy subject, the European Union's islands. There are thousands upon thousands of them, and four of the EU member states are entirely island nations, the UK, Ireland, Cyprus and Malta. It is a particular geography with particular characteristics, needs and problems. In our programme, we're looking at some of the most pressing, including how the EU's islanders procure and produce the food they need to eat. We're also asking why so often it's a case of water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Later in the programme, we're taking you to the French Caribbean. But first, we're starting off here in the EU's tiniest member state of Malta. A lifetime of farming has taught Julian Borg about just how precious Malta's water is. In the past five years, he's converted his farm to grow lettuces vertically. This hydroponics technique uses 80% less water than conventional farming. Malta being a very small island, you make much better use of the space and the water. The water problem is becoming worse and worse, and so we need to come up with innovative ideas to make more efficient use of the water. Agriculture is Malta's biggest single user of water. Like most Maltese farmers, Julian relies on underground aquifers using a borehole to pump water to his crops. Julian's son, Malcolm Borg, is in charge of a European research project aimed at teaching farmers new techniques to reduce their water usage. If we want to continue growing our own food, we have to ensure that we have a good supply, both in terms of quantity and quality, a good supply, of water for the farmers to use to irrigate their crops. Only 500 millimetres of rain falls each year in Malta, far from sufficient for the island's farmers. The new water project, recycled sewage water, is a potentially crucial innovation. Benny Camilleri is one of the first beneficiaries. It's important, yes, for us, because we have, from the boreholes, we have big sanity. Eh? Big sanity is a problem. Eh? The past six years have been exceptionally dry in Malta. That's forced farmers to pump more groundwater, leaving supplies scarcer and saltier. New water has helped Benny improve his yield, as well as use less water. What's different is that we are using much less water than we used to, because when you use good quality water, you need much less. And yes, the crop did produce more. It went very well. Malta hopes to produce 7 billion litres of new water, enough to irrigate a quarter of its agricultural land. It takes the island's sewage and, using ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis and disinfection, produces a polished water that's fit for agricultural use. And from here, opening one of the pressure vessels of the RO, we can basically see the final product water which is being delivered to the farmers. The watchword of this 20 million euro project is sustainability. But a major challenge has been overcoming customer worries about using recycled water from the sewers to grow food. It has the potential to ensure the sustainable development of our agricultural sector, ensure the protection of our water resources, natural water resources, uh, but it has to be done in a ma manner which is safe. We cannot address just quantity and forget about quality. Farming in a drier world isn't just about high-tech solutions. Iman Vela is experimenting with a traditional Maltese crop that's fallen from favour, pomegranates. The fruit is ideally suited to the parched local conditions. It's a fast-growing tree, actually. It doesn't dem demand much water. It's happy with the hot temperature. Eman's family also farms peaches, which consume more water and have a shorter shelf life. Finding native alternatives could help farming in Malta to survive. Malta is just a, a small island with very limited land resources, and we have to provide research and experimentation on methods that can be replicated by others um, to get the most out of this, this, little, this little piece of farmland we've got. Malta is on the front line of climate change. The future for its farmers will depend on solutions that are both rooted in the past and use innovative technology. Now, this soil might look a little dry, but I can tell you it's actually doing a lot better than the three previous seasons. This land belongs to this man, Joseph Muska. Hello. Nice, nice to meet you, Kadran. Nice to meet you. Uh, how big a worry for you is the dryness and drought in Malta? Uh, Malta will have a big problem because we are uh, one of the southest countries in Europe. I mean, uh, we have a Mediterranean climate and from year to year, 
we feel that it's getting always worse. Now there's a great variety of different farming goes on in Malta. I can see in front of us there are these terraces, but I understand they're not actually cultivated anymore. Um, I know you've said that you're worried Maltese farming could die out within 20 years. Why is that? The production costs um, are getting always higher and the prices we're getting are always, I mean, getting more lower because of uh, the importation and the competition. And unfortunately, farmers, I mean, uh, young farmers are choosing other, I mean, sectors where to work. Well, you are very much still farming. I know this is your tomato greenhouse behind you. Let's go inside and have a look. Yes. Here we are inside the greenhouse. Uh, Joseph, this is one of your main products. We come from generations of farmers and our main production is um, uh, mostly is greenhouse tomato production. And these will be exported or eaten here in Malta? No, these are for the local market. Okay, well let's walk and uh, look at the rest of your tomato plants while we yeah. talk. We've heard about some of your concerns about Maltese farming. Um, do you believe that your concerns are being listened to by local decision makers, by the European Union? I think every government we had in Malta and we have in Malta, I mean, I think it doesn't want that agriculture, I mean, Malta finish, first of all, because of food security for our nation, and um, secondly, because um, it's part also from our heritage. Regarding the EU, I think um, EU was, uh, although it helped us a lot, but I mean, uh, there is, I think, some decisions that are not suitable for every country, unfortunately. Being a member of the EU means that there's this free movement of goods, uh, around 80% of Malta's food comes in as exports from countries like Italy where they can just produce at scale much more cheaply. Surely, in that sense, being an EU member is a problem, isn't it? We feel that sometimes we can't compete. We are in a big disadvantage with these big countries that have massive pieces mm -hmm. of land mm -hmm. and massive uh, agriculture industry. There is um, uh, some food fraud because these uh, produce, these produce are sold as Maltese products, and that is a big, um, a big concern also for us farm farmers, because people are buying that they think they, it is um, the Maltese produce, which is for us not fair. Hopefully, I mean, Europe, I mean, will take some action about this, and uh, also the Maltese government, I mean, to control, to control this fraud. Mm. Okay, all right, well, thank you very much for introducing us to your farm, to yeah. your lovely products there. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go off and meet at the Agriculture Minister next, Joseph Muska, thank, thank you very you much very for your much. time. Thank you very much, thank you, thank you very much, Catherine, okay. Well, here we are then at the Environment Ministry to meet the Parliamentary Secretary for Agriculture, Clint Camilleri. Thank you for having us. Good morning. Hi. So we've just been meeting uh, with a Maltese farmer who told us about some of his concerns. He thinks Maltese farming could die out within a generation. How much of the problems farmers are facing here in Malta down to the fact that we are on an island? Yes, um, obviously Malta is an island and depends on transportation costs, mainly by sea also, to import machinery, to import pesticides, to import anything basically towards the island. So that is an additional cost that our farmer has to pay. And that makes the farmer less competitive with its European counterparts. Now, 80% of Malta's food is currently imported. Uh, surely that's a risk, not just for the people who live here, but also, of course, for the tourism industry that's so important. Uh, it's obviously, difficult to compete with other countries who have bigger, bigger farmland. We are starting to promote local produce, local farmers, local food, and also educating the local population the need to consume local products, the need to sustain our farming industry, the need to have um, food security in our islands. I suppose that means that you're asking locals to spend a little bit more because you're hoping that they believe in keeping the produce local. Yes, uh, um, uh, we must also invest in our farmers, we must also help our farmers and we must also devise new measures also within the common agricultural policy that uh, our farmers can make use of and can benefit from. Mm. We've been hearing about an issue of food fraud. Does your government have a strategy to combat this? One of our targets is to have um, more traceability, better presentation in order to sustain, in order to help the local farmer. Overall, would you say that being a member of the European Union has in fact been a good thing 
for Maltese farming? Because in many ways it looks like it hasn't. We need to have the common agriculture policy, the EU agriculture policy, that does in fact take care of the local problems, of the local issues, that do not necessarily mean that we have the same issues as other EU states. Southern countries, island states need to cooperate more in order to pass their message across. And we need to sit down, find common positions, and also convince the European Union, the Commission, that what we're saying is the reality and we need to have a change. All right, Clint Camilleri, thank you very much for meeting with us. Thank you very us. much. Thank you. We're looking to the future on this island where financial services and tourism are so dominant, there are concerns that low incomes and red tape are discouraging young people from going into farming. Our reporter Luke Brown has been investigating. Pierre, Ruben and Clyde aren't your typical farmers. They work in Malta's IT sector. But in their spare time, they're building an aquaponics farm, raising fish and growing vegetables together. Today, they're testing a new pump to increase productivity. It's actually over-oxygenating the water. We get better plant growth, much better plant growth. We prefer lettuce, we get it in 25 days instead of 35 or 45. Aquaponics uses up to 95% less water than conventional farms and it requires less space, ideal for a small dry island like Malta. The fish produce um, much of the food needed for the plants, so that's basically it. The plants then um, will clean the water, which will go back to the fish. The team has just learned they'll receive €140,000 from the EU for young farmers. After four years at the development stage, now they're about to build a new full-scale greenhouse. It's a sense of fright for me, definitely. It's amazing what this thing can do. The goal is to be commercially viable within a year, selling both the fish and the veg. Innovative agriculture could help attract young people to farming. At 55, the average age of farmers in Malta is higher than the EU average. It's very much less physically demanding. And then the, there is also the, the technological part, which I think young people uh, are attracted to as well. The younger generation, they're, they're more inclined to technology. They're, they're, they're surrounded by it every day, so... Only 30% of the island's food is produced locally. A dry climate and the need to import feed and equipment push up costs and the high price of land excludes many newcomers. Carl Scary and Jeanette Borg are part of Maya, a foundation promoting young farmers' interests. They see a bleak future for the sector and for Malta without farming. People need to realise that if this industry dies, many other things will die. Not only the farmers, not only the farming families will suffer, not only the industry, but also other industries. Agriculture represents less than 2% of Malta's GDP and barely 2,000 full-time farmers. Many young farmers feel they're not a priority for the government. We need a stronger political will to restructure our sector, not only because we have a few issues that we've inherited all over the years, but also because we need a strong image that agriculture can be a career and uh, that the current issues need to be solved. One solution for Malta's government encouraged farmers to aim for small niche markets. For the past three years, René Desira has diversified to produce edible flowers using innovative techniques and marketing. He now has a loyal local clientele. But René has the same problem as many in his generation. Faced with so many obstacles, his children don't want to take on his farm. I wish I can, my son or uh, one of my daughters, continue with this uh... But, I don't know, it's not easy. It's a video. But, till I'm here, I continue. Malta's farming lies at a crossroads. Incomes in agriculture are falling fast behind other sectors. Unless change is brought, it risks becoming a pastime and no longer a profession. an experimental farm. It's part of the National Agricultural Research Centre. And right here we've got something that you'll see all around Malta. This is a prickly pear tree and uh, these are used as hedges in Maltese farms to stop the very strong winds from eroding the soil, damaging the plants. We've come here to meet 
the director of the Rural Payments Agency, the man who's in charge of liaising with Brussels about farmers' subsidies. Justin Zara, nice to meet you. Hi. Hello there. Now, um, let's take a walk along these prickly pear trees. Of course. Um, we've been meeting with farmers earlier in our programme who aren't necessarily very optimistic. As things stand, are you optimistic for farming in Malta? When you see that there are certain factors of difficulty that make competing uh, a little more difficult and that you have to actually invest money and take risks, um, uh, it can tend to, to yes, leave some people uh, pessimistic. But I think that really and truly we are uh, making progress in uh, trying to give a vision um, for what farming can be like. As the EU looks into the future, where should EU money be spent? One of the things that we do not agree entirely with the European Commission's proposals with for the next common agricultural policy is that of demanding more from farmers without giving them more. We think that we need to only be able to ask for more if we are also supporting them more. Because ultimately, if we lose uh, local productions, not just in Malta, but in Europe, we would only be helping to substitute produce that we know about because we have European standards with produce from other countries that perhaps may not meet the same expectations of consumers. Well, thank you very much, Justin Zara. Really great to meet you. Thanks. Thank you. Time now for us to set sail for part two of our programme. We're heading across the Atlantic to the French Caribbean island of Martinique. From historical pesticide scandal to current day battles with tropical insects, it's quite another vision of European island life. We'll see you there in part two. Keep up to date on the latest from the Middle East. We bring you political, economic, and cultural events from the region in this weekly Middle Eastern program. Middle East Matters, presented by Sanam Chantier, on France 24 and France24.com.